Will you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1? Ephesians 1, and this will be the last of the Spiritual Benefits series, and this is part 3, um, and it will be the last of the verses of, of Paul's doxology. Um, those verses, verses 13 and 14, is the end of this doxology. It's almost as it's as if Paul is now catching a breath in verse thirteen and fourteen. He has this this long um, run on sentence. This is where I kind of look at you know the teachers and the and the crowd here. You should not frown upon run on sentences. Paul did them, and he he did a great job of actually exalting this work of God from eternity past to Christ's work, and then now we're going to peer into the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. So with that, it's only two verses, verses 13 and 14. I'll read those, and we'll get into it. This is God's infallible and errant and inspired word. Verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Pray with me. Brother, this evening, as usual, we desire that you teach us, and, and even so within this text, it tells us of the Holy Spirit the spirit that you've pledged to us, you've given to us, or to, to give as a sign, as an inheritance, to a promise that is here and, and, and not yet. So I pray now that you bless our time together. In Christ's name, amen. It's 1518. If you know history, or at least Protestant history, do you, you know what happened in 1517, right? October 31st, 1517. But what's significant about 1518, almost a year later, in Christian history? One year after Martin Luther had posted his 95 Thesis on the, the church doors of Wittenberg, Luther would, would now travel to... Heidelberg to defend or to give thought to his thesis, as, as he thought that he was going to give some sort of defense. In that same year, a young, ambitious, and brilliant 21-year-old would arrive at the University of Wittenberg where Martin Luther taught. They would have him as their first Greek professor. Luther and him would become great friends and allies in the Reformation. His name was Philip Melanchthon. Luther called him Master Philip. The partnership was odd, but Melanchthon was captivated by Luther. You can imagine what kind of person Luther was. Um, even at times seeming like he could fly off the handle. He was, he was bold to a fault. Melanchthon was not like that at all. But the friendship was, was solidified, in a sense codified within them teaching in, in the University of Wittenberg. During all of Luther's turmoil, Melanchthon was there with him. This friendship became deeper when they began to debate. It was a Roman Catholic apologist, Johann Eck. And they were debating Melanchthon. Philip began to debate uh, publicly, Johann, over the issues of sola scriptura and the authority of scripture. That the, the scriptures alone are the authority within the, the church, not tradition. Not man-made doctrines, but the scriptures alone. That debate was originally only with Philip Melanchthon. Until Luther stepped in 
as the senior professor, and he took over this debate, and in some ways he, he didn't really help much. As, as Luther would say for himself, this is recalling back to this situation. He said this about, about Master Philip. He said, Master Philip cups with a precise, as precise as a knife. I simply swing an axe. So when he went into this debate with Johann Eck, he had no idea what he was getting into. And, and you see Martin Luther like a bull in a china shop, right? But Philip was not like that. Philip was precise. They were very different. And that was extremely helpful. When the question of this came up during the Reformation, as they were refining many doctrines within the church itself, the question, a simple question came up, what is faith? What is faith? Or what are the, what are the elements of saving faith? I don't know if you've asked yourself that question before. You think, what is faith? How do I begin to explain this? Well, Luther answered the question, and he gave a, a Latin term. And you never sound really smart, and so you can write this down, you can sound really smart by using Latin also. And this is his phrase that he uses, fides vita, which means living faith. But that didn't answer the question. He needed more reforming. He needed a scalpel, not an axe. Melanchthon and Calvin would be those, those precise scalpels to bring deeper meaning to the question, what is faith? So as we look deeper into Scripture to bring clarity to this question, I believe you'll notice that we will benefit from Melanchthon's work. So I only have two points. That's only two verses, two points. And they're simple. The, number one, the, the anatomy of faith. And second, my second point is the spirit of faith. The anatomy of faith and the spirit of faith. Verse 13. Because in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the spirit of promise. We enter this, this portion of scripture with, with still, um, I don't know if you think this way, but we still have this, this tension. Theologians call them a paradox. You still have this paradox because, you see, in verse 4 it says, Before the foundation of the world, he chose for himself a people. In verse 5 it says that these people are predestined. In verse 11 he repeats it again. He says these people are predestined. We turn back to Ephesians and let's look at this idea of first anatomy, the first essential of saving faith and it's found in the words here it says after listening to the message of truth noticia what does that mean you keep saying it let me explain this is the content of faith faith like i said earlier has an object right the object is the lord jesus christ and Noticia says that we must know something about him. Something or some things you need to know about him. Listen, let me put it out there. No one has ever gotten saved by saying, hey, Jesus loves you. That's even a spit in the face in Noticia. It's like, you know, do, do you see me as a simpleton? No. You need to know certain things about Christ. The definition of Noticia is simple. It's either notice or acquainted. 
Notice or acquainted. Acquainted with what? The truths of Christ. How much truth? As much truth as you can put out there to whoever you're talking to. What do they need to know? What, what are the essentials of the, the, of the doctrine of salvation? Where do you start? Genesis 1? I don't know. And then the Revelation. But they need to know particular things about Christ. The God of man lived the perfect life, died on a cross for an, an atonement for all those that would believe, and then rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven to take his throne. That's simple, right? It's not that difficult, and it's a lot, it's a lot better than Jesus loves you. This is why our message must be clear, precise. Accurate. Let me tell you something that seems so obvious in your in your gospel witnessing that your message must be biblical. It must not be based in some sort of emotion, and and it, it's not based in your testimony. Yes, share your testimony, but it can't be based in your testimony. It must be biblical. It must be. It must have language that is biblical. Biblical language with biblical content. What am I saying? Use your Bible. Because if you don't listen, if you don't, and and you skip over what Melanchthon was trying to teach us, you skip over Noticia, the notice, the the content of the gospel. And I could ask you a question. Do you think that person could be saved if you gave the, an unprecise or, or faulty or short message? No, they can't. They won't know what they're believing. This notitia, we need the basic information about, about justification in Christ. You know, we see this. Let, let me show you in Romans, Romans chapter 10. Paul says some really helpful things in this section, but listen, listen to when he begins to explain things and, and tell me that you don't, you don't hear what I'm saying. He says this in verse 14, John 10, verse, I mean, Romans 10, verse 14. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as there is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Verse 16, however, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You know what you hear there in those verses? Notitia, notitia, notitia. Tell them. Tell them these truths. He says they need to hear it. No one is going to get saved by you mowing your neighbor's lawn. Do you understand that? That's a good witness. No one is going to get saved by that. Your neighbor's not going to wake up and say, man, justification by faith because he mowed my lawn. What's the second one? Let's look at the second one. Turn back to Ephesians. We have a census. And this is where you find, you look at verse 13, it says, after listen to the message of truth, the gospel of, our, of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. Well, you have this, if you notice, this personal pronoun, your. You know, you're beginning to listen to this gospel being preached to you. And now you're beginning, you're kind of beginning to make it your own. This Gospel of your salvation, this, it makes it 
this faith personal. Like, listen, no one gets into heaven in a crowd. You're not walking in with your parents. You're not riding the coattails of your grandparents. You're not walking in with your pastor. This, this gospel must be yours. So what is it talking about here? This ascensus, you see, Notitia on its own is not enough to save anyone. It's information, right? We can know the facts about Christianity. And even more specifically, you can know things about Christ and yet not believe it's true. I don't think I've met anyone ever that I've asked them, well, what did God do for sinners? And they say, they crucified Jesus. I think that's kind of universal around the world. I, I think it would be highly rare of you not hearing that. But is that person saved just because they said it out loud? They said, God sent his son to die on a cross. No. No. Millions of people around the world know some things about Jesus. They know about the cross. They even admire Christ. They admire Jesus. They, they even would even sometimes, if you talk to people, would even have an emotional connection to the truths of Christ. An emotional response if you begin to share with them these truths. The saving faith, this second part, the second element here of saving faith has an intellectual assent. A sensus, that's what it means, intellectual assent. Now, do I mean that it has to be academic? No. No, like, no, it does not mean that you have to have some sort of doctorate to understand these things. It's not talking about that. Intellectual just means that you're using your brain to understand what is being told to you. And you do understand it. And a census basically says, now, my convictions are being raised because what I'm hearing. Remember Hebrews 11.1? 1? The convictions of of things not seen, that's what it's talking about. The context of the message, you at the moment believe it's true. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 2, look at verse 13. It says, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, uh, For this reason we also con consistently thank God, constantly thank God, that when you receive the word of God, that's Notitia, which you heard from us, right, do you hear that? Do you see it? You accepted it not as the words of men, that's a sensus, intellectual assent, you Calculated in your mind that this is not the words of men. But for what they really are, the words of God. Which also performs its work in you who believe. Do you see that now? You see those elements even within that verse? You know, Romans 10, 9 says this. And you guys know this verse. It says, if you confess your with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. The confession would be an ascensus. You, you are agreeing with that truth. And then we get to our last part of this anatomy of faith, is which is the most important. You could have the other two, and if you don't have this last one, it's not saving faith. And the last one is fiducia. And we just seen it in short, and in in Romans 10, 9, to believe. You know the information. You believe it's true. And now you put your trust in it. It's in our, our verse also. Look at verse 13 again. Having also believed.
The two previous categories are not enough to save anyone. Faith must be appropriated. It must be put, you must put your trust in the truths of the gospel itself. And, and even more plain talks, you understand you need to put your trust in Christ. John 1.12 says that, right? So as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. The truths of the gospel demand we have a, an exclusive trust in God's plan of salvation through Christ alone. You see this, right? Look at, again, Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, just one verse. In verse 22, says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Or John, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Believe into Christ. Verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has not judged, has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Same chapter, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. That's a guarantee. You know the information. You trust the information. You believe it's true. Now it's time for action. Now it's, I need to believe. Ascending to, to the truths of the gospel. And knowing that this is, this is what true saving faith looks like. You know, there's, a, there's this verse, right? You know in James 2.19, where it distinguishes this idea. You remember it says, you believe that, that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe in shudder. What's he saying? What is James saying? You know what he's saying? Oh, you have noticia? You have a census? You have an intellectual ascent. You studied the Gospels. You've read the Bible. You know the truths that are found there. Yet your belief falls short of true trust in Christ. They believe the information. These demons believe the information also. But they don't have faith. One must trust in the in Him alone, in Christ alone for salvation. Is all that has been said. Even everything I just said about this saving faith. I, I want to remind you of something. Turn back to Ephesians, and and even with all that, in chapter two, we have this this beautiful thought. That because we think to ourselves like, well, wait a second. Well, I had all these elements and. Thus, I must, you know, be someone special because I had saving faith. No. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. In context, you know what the gift of God is? Everything that is said in that verse. The grace is a gift. The faith even to save you is a gift. So guess who, from beginning to end, saves you? God. And this is where we enter into my second point, the spirit of faith, which is, this is the beauty of this whole end of this passage. Now we enter this, this truth of what the Holy Spirit has done. 
Look at verse 13, the latter portion says, You were sealed in him, in who? In Christ, this is with the Holy Spirit of promise. After saving faith has been placed in Christ, albeit happen, happening simultaneously, I want, I want you to understand that. It's not like you have these little bits and pieces of saving faith and you know, you're going to have a little, bit of, a little bit of belief, a little bit of change, a little bit of a direction in life. No, no, no. The way Scripture shows is that you have a complete 180 in your life because with, with faith comes repentance. It's a two-sided coin. You turn from your sin that crucified your Savior, and at this moment, these things happen at the same time. And what happens here, what it's telling us, is that at that point, at the moment of your salvation, it says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. As a promise. You know, there's some teaching around there that, that they talk about this seal as if it's some sort of mark or, 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 or stamp on your soul to, to, show that, to show the demons that you belong to God. This is, this is ridiculous. Listen, the, the seal is, is a person. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, yes, he's giving you this seal as in like, if you think about a king and an edict, right? You, you have this edict and it's stamped by the seal of the king. And, and you hold on to this seal, it belongs to you. And, and no one can touch you until you deliver that, that message, right? Because you come with the power of the king. As if, if anyone touches you, as this, it's as if they're touching the king himself. But it's more beautiful than that. You see, the seal is the residing, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This one that has, you know, not merely done some sort of part in salvation. Listen, the Holy Spirit applied your redemption. You know, the Father set the plan in, in eternity past. The Son accomplished it in time on a cross and in His resurrection. And the Holy Spirit comes to apply salvation into the hearts, into the stony, rocky hearts the dead in sins and trespasses to make alive in Christ. And then He makes you alive and then He lives in you. This is why your view as if like, like someone had taken the scales off your eyes and you see the world different, don't you? You see it for what it really is. You know why? Because you're seeing it through the lens of what the Holy Spirit is showing you and teaching you. This is the redemption. And he seals you because he doesn't just redeem you in a moment, but now he will keep you. And then eventually, he will usher you into glory. You know, in chapter 4, look at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And look what it says here, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, can't you thank God that it's not up to you? That it's not up to you. I'm sure some of you give the Holy Spirit a hard time. That's what the verse says. <laughs> but even though you grieve the Holy Spirit, He says He sealed you. He's not removing this seal because He's saving you to the day that you will be completely redeemed, glorified, the sin, the, the sin that so easily entangles you will be gone because the Holy Spirit deems it to be so. And you know what? He will not fail. This is the benefit, or one of the spiritual benefits that, that is the greatest one of all of them that I just told you that we've gone through for the past weeks. It's actually the most important one since 
the work of the Holy Spirit is vital to the, the aspect of just salvation, but also your sanctification. Jesus thought it crucial for his own disciples to understand this. He wanted them to know what is the role of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're thinking, what is going on here? You're, you're about to get crucified. I don't understand what is happening. And then he begins to tell them, look at, look, let's turn to John 14. He begins to explain to them, and, and this should actually, even us, on this side of the gospel, on this side of the cross, we, we don't have to feel like the disciples felt. They had this new information. Jesus is like telling them all these things that are all new. But we can take joy in this because we know now we have this full, complete revelation to ourselves. But you see this. Look at verse 1. You see the heart of Christ. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He says, listen, guys. Listen. He tells them, you, you have to understand, do not let your heart be troubled because God has not and will not fail you. And then he tells them all these things, but I want you to jump down to, to verse 16. Well, keep your finger there. He tells them he's leaving, they're confused, they're fearful, but he must, he must leave. He has to go. And he says this in verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. You know, the Greek, the paraclete. The Bible says the paraclete as in he will come alongside you. You know, and when Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He means that he's giving you the paraclete. That one of the names of the paraclete is the Spirit of Christ. So if you have the Holy Spirit, you have Christ. It says, I will send you a helper that he may be with you for a few years. Maybe a few weeks. You know what? When you have a bad day, he won't be with you. Okay, guys? Is that what it says? He will be with you forever. There's... No end to his help. And, and I want to exhort you in this. Have you ever prayed, like when you're really struggling, Holy Spirit, please, I can't do this without you. In this moment, I need you. Listen to what it says. Look at what he calls him in verse 17. That is the spirit of truth. Complete antithesis to the devil is a liar. It says, in whom the world cannot receive. Why doesn't the world receive him? Because they're under the thumb of the evil one. Because they did not see him or know him. But you know him. Because he abides with you. And then eventually will be in you. That's, that's beautiful. That's, that's cause for you to be like, you know what? From this day forward, if I struggle, my surrender is going to look a lot like me having a lot of conversations with the Holy Spirit. You know, teach me. And this is, this is the thing. You hear me say this every time I pray, and now you're going to hear it every time I say it. Every time I come up here to open the Word of God, I pray this one particular thing every single time. Lord, Holy Spirit, teach your church. You know, if he doesn't teach you, you, you're, you could hear what I'm saying. But it's not going to mean that it's not going to go deep into your soul. Unless the Holy, Holy Spirit deems it in that moment to say, look at you, doll of hearing. This is for you. This is the word of truth. The spirit of truth. This is part of this new covenant. The better covenant, Hebrews calls it, right? The Holy Spirit will reside and live in every believer. 
And what does it say about this Holy Spirit? It says the Holy Spirit will, some of the things that the Holy Spirit will be doing is that he, he will guide you into all truth. Right? That's John 16, 13. He empowers you to avoid sin. He, he equips us for the work of the ministry by utilizing the gifts that he's given you. All this has its foundation in this, in this teaching. What does saving faith look like? Can it be detached from the work of the Holy Spirit? No. Is, is there a second blessing? Is there some sort of second baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, there is not. No, there is not. John 14, look at verse 26 if you're still there. It says, but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There you go. That's the authority. You're in Christ and you're in his name. You will send him in my name. It says, he will teach you all things. And bring to remembrance all that I said to you. I love that. Will he, will he teach you some things? All things. First John chapter 2, verse 27 says this, As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. That's the Holy Spirit. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and it is not a lie, and just as it is taught to you, you abide in him. Now, does this mean that you're going to understand everything in Scripture? No, no, I don't believe so. I'll see what in a given pastors and teachers it says, right? But you, you'll know essential, deep truth. He even prayed in John 17. Jesus prayed also in John 17, verse 17. It says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. I truly believe at that moment he's talking to the Holy Spirit. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. He's cornered the market, right? That's what he's saying. He's cornered the market on truth. You don't want to you, you don't learn from God somewhere else. You don't go outside and like hug a tree and think that you've connected with God. You understand that? You want to know God's revelation, it's right here. Look at one, one more in John 15, verse 26. says, when the helper comes, when I, send, when, I, when I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who presides, uh, for, proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. He's going to remind you of Christ. The second thing in our text about the Holy Spirit says that the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge. Verse 14, Ephesians 1, it says, Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The Greek for pledge is arabon, which means, like in a simple terms, it means down payment. The, the Lord, as a good and gracious and merciful God, keeps his word, doesn't he? And at times he has made covenants with men, unfaithful nations and men. But he still makes these covenants. He still makes these pledges and promises. He makes these pledges as, and is faithful to keep every single one of them. I love what 2 Corinthians says. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn there quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 20. It says this. Chapter 1 verse 20. It says, For as many as, the, as are the promises of God, in him there are yes, and therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. That just means in short that God will never break a promise to you. Look at verse 21. 
Now he who has established us with you in Christ, that's the Holy Spirit has established you in Christ, and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a promise. But the Lord doesn't make any empty promises. You know what he does? He makes a promise and then he gives of himself. He gave you his son and then he comes to reside in you. The promise that this Holy Spirit would never leave you. Thirdly, this work of the Holy Spirit in our text, it says, it points us back to this particular redemption. Look at verse 14 in Ephesians again. It says, with the view of the redemption of God's own possession. So we have this, this obvious statement. You know, the Holy Spirit, let me ask you a question. Do you think the Holy Spirit indwells everyone? The answer is no, right? So we have to understand when we look at this verse, this is the view of redemption of God's own possession. The Holy Spirit has a particular people in mind to redeem, right? The Holy Spirit has been sent to the ones that he will redeem by faith. A people of his own possession, it says. Are, are those people, people already set in the mind of God? We've already seen that in verse 3 and 5 and 11. Look at, look at Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verse 28. I love this because he gives, Luke is giving this exhortation to, to pastors. And, and it's an encouragement because this is what it says is, Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Is, is this a particular flock or is this a random flock? It's a particular flock. To the shepherd of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And this is this is where it, it, lines, uh, it, it lies the kind of the controversy is did, God, did Christ shed his, his blood for people that are in hell right now? The answer should be no. This is, this is why this particular redemption gives more glory to God, not less. He's, he's come to take upon himself all those that are his possession. The Holy Spirit has a task of accomplishing one um, amazing, great job. And this is his job. It's to gather the bride of Christ. And for what reason? Turn back to Ephesians 1. Look at, again, our verse 14. As it ends in the same way that all these other stanzas have ended. Why does he do what he do? Why does God do what he does? Why does he give you the Holy Spirit? Why does he, why does he draw you to himself? Why does he bring you to an understanding, an intellectual ascent? And why does he bring you to the end of yourself? And why does he teach you and show you your need for Christ? Why does he put before you the, the sin why does he put before you the things that God hates so you would see it for yourself and say, I'm in need of a Savior? Why does he do all that? Why does he send the Holy Spirit after you've believed? Why does he send them to reside in you? You know why? To the praise of his glory. That's why. We are saved given the Holy Spirit, sealed and pledged to a, a true redemption, chosen and predestined 
as a distinct group of people, not for our own glory, no, to the praise of his glory, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is why we exist. And if you understood that tonight, I pray that you would exercise a true trust in Christ for what he's done. It's enough wasting time. Christ died to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Then you need him. Pray with me. Father, I come before you. Thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to be able to live a life that we could not live apart from you. I thank you that you've set aside in holiness your church, that you continue to sanctify her through the preaching of your word and to, through personal devotion and through prayer and through all the means of grace. Lord, I thank you for equipping us with all these things. Lord, we are lost without you. So I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to work in the hearts and minds of your people. And for those that don't know you, I pray that you would bring the heavy conviction of sin and that they would see their need for your Son. They would see their, their need for the work of Christ on the cross. Lord, I thank you again that you continually do these things in your church, that you glorify yourself and change lives. And we give you all the praise and the glory in Christ's name. Amen.